Hey everybody, we are opening up to Leviticus chapter 21 today, and we're looking at regulations about the priests. Now, some of these regulations are, are going to continue, some regulations for the priests in regard to what they ate and the sacrifices in chapter 22, as well as some regulations about offerings for the people in chapter 22. And then when we're going to get to 23 in the very near future, uh, we're planning to slow down. So we've been covering some very large swaths of scripture. There's been a lot of verses, a lot of uh, content in the passages we've been looking at. But when we get to Leviticus chapter 23, I just want to kind of paint the picture. We're going to be there pretty soon, and I'm looking forward to it because we're going to go much slower. We're going to see the feasts of the Lord, and we're going to take some time to really go through these feasts in Israel. And perhaps you've studied those before. Perhaps you're interested in the feasts of Israel and what they represented. We're going to be getting to that very soon, so look forward to that. Uh, but for today, if you would open up your Bible to Leviticus chapter 21 with me, I want to ask that you would look with me at the regulations for the priests, regulations for the Levitical priesthood on how they were supposed to live. And as we go through, I'm going to be uh, reading the scripture and, and you know, we're going to be talking about that. And I'm also going to make some theological connections that I believe these regulations point to based upon what Jesus fulfilled for us as the high priest and based upon clear theological truths in the New Testament. But before I walk through that today, I want to remind you of our acronym. It's been a while since I've reminded you, and so I want to bring that up again. You, in the Gen 1 to Revelation 22 project, we start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we're walking through Scripture verse by verse, passage by passage. I want to remind you, of the overarching simple method of our study, which is an acronym called SOAP, like a bar of soap that you will use, S-O-A-P. It's, it's not by any means original with me. It is something that's been around for a long time. But the SOAP, SOAP acronym stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. And there have been times when I've walked you through each of those steps, like we just go through the scripture, we read it, then we go through the observations, then the applications, then the prayer. And there's times that that's kind of all mixed together. But it's a very simple tool to help you study your Bible. Point number one, read the scripture itself. What is scripture saying? That leads into the second part of the acronym, observe, observation. What is the text of scripture saying? What is it saying in light of other passages of Scripture you know? Is there, is there another truth from the New Testament that applies to the Old? So we bring those together. We observe what the whole counsel of God's Word is saying, and we let Scripture interpret itself. And then A, we apply it to our life. We make application of it. How does this apply? It very clearly may apply to our worldview. It may apply doctrinally. It may apply theologically. It may apply in a very practical way in your day-to-day -day life. And then, of course, the last letter is prayer. And prayer, I believe, is so important. When we approach Scripture, when we are studying Scripture together, we need a prayerful heart, listening to the Lord and desiring to obey His Word, asking the Lord to not only help us understand Scripture, but to apply it to our lives and to live it. And that is a prayerful attitude that we need throughout the entire time of our study and also as the clincher. So I know I've had a rather lengthy introduction today, but I wanted to remind you of those things. Chapter 21 here in Leviticus, starting in verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother, also his virgin sister who is near to him, who has no husband, for her he may defile himself. Otherwise he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. Now what this part of, of the passage is talking about, is it's talking about that the Israelite priests were not supposed to go and go around the dead for any reason. In other words, they weren't allowed to go and, and minister um, and, and take time for bereavement to go near a dead body. Because they were offering the sacrifices to God, that required ceremonial cleanliness. And we looked at a lot of that in the past in Leviticus. But in order to stay ceremonially clean, they could not go near dead bodies. Otherwise, they would have to go through a period of, 
of quarantining and ritualistically re-cleaning themselves to become ceremonially clean to once again offer the sacrifices. They had to be above reproach and had to meet standards of holiness in order to do that ministry for the Lord because they were symbolizing, ultimately, they were symbolizing and foreshadowing what Jesus would come to do. That Jesus was our perfect sacrifice. He was clean before God. He was sinless and therefore he could offer the sacrifice on our behalf. The priests who were fallen, sinful men in themselves had to go through a process of atoning for their own sin and becoming ceremonially clean in order to make sacrifices that foreshadowed what Jesus would come do. And so they were only allowed in certain cases of those of near kin in order to pollute themselves and then go defile themselves in a ceremonial sense, not a not a sinful sense, but a ceremonial sense of defiling themselves because they were near a dead body. It was only allowed for nearest of kin. It then goes on in verse 5 to talk about, They shall not make any bald place on their heads, nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God, for they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy. Now, we've talked a little bit about this before, but the Jewish priests, and the Jewish men for that matter, but the priests especially, were to be examples of holiness to the Lord, separate from the paganism of the Canaanites. And we've seen a lot of references in the last few lessons in these chapters to how the Lord was driving out the Canaanites because of their abominable practices, because of their paganism, because of their sexual perversion. The land was vomiting out the Canaanites, and the promised land was being given to the Israelites. The, the Canaanites were being utterly destroyed because of their sins they repu refused to repent for. Part of the, the priestly worship of the Canaanites involved cutting one's hair. The priests would shave their heads or shave part of their heads or part of their beards in order to mark themselves according to their pagan rituals. And the Jewish priests... These men were to not go and to make any bald place upon their head. If they naturally went bald, they lost their hair, that was fine. But they were not to try to make bald spots on their head to somehow mark themselves as being special or being priestly. They were instead to live a holy life in humility before the Lord. This is even pointing to the fact that they were not supposed to shave the edges of their beards. Something pagan priests would sometimes do is cut different patterns or whatever in their face, uh, their facial um adornment of their facial hair. They would do different things to mark themselves as priests or even as part of their pagan worship as an identifying mark. The Jewish priests were supposed to allow their beard to grow. They, they weren't supposed to cut off certain edges of it or like grow it into a cone like the Egyptian priests and, and the Egyptian pharaoh would. They were supposed to allow their beard to either be well kept or to grow completely on all of its edges as God provided the growth as a mark that they are humbly serving their creator God who has created them, who has caused the facial hair that they had to grow in that way. And there's no need to dignify themselves by somehow manicuring it and recutting it to try to appear dignified. I hope I've made my point there. But that was something that they were not supposed to do, nor were they supposed to make cuttings in their flesh, another thing they would do in pagan worship. The, the priests were to be an example of godliness and humility in every way that they lived. It goes on then to talk specifically in regard to their own marriages. And, and I think there's something to be said here about how this parallels to some degree um, the call for pastors, elders in the New Testament in Timothy, and Titus to be men who are above reproach. These priests were to be above reproach in their marriage life. And notice the admonition against divorce. We're going to see this. And this is interesting because divorce was permitted under Mosaic law, but divorce was not God's ideal. It was not what God intended from the beginning with Adam and Eve. And so the priests were to be above reproach in their marriage relationships. And notice how these requirements are given. Uh, let's start in verse 7. They shall not take a wife who is a harlot, or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to God. Therefore you shall consecrate him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I am the Lord who sanctifies you and holy. And it goes on to say in verse 9, The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, 
she profanes her father, she should be burned with fire. We see several things in these few verses. First of all, that the priest is not allowed to marry a prostitute, a harlot. He's not allowed to marry a profaned woman who is involved in this type, this defiledness of pagan worship. He also is not allowed to take to wife a woman who has been divorced. Now, this says nothing about a widow. A, a priest could marry a widow. However, this is a normal priest. A high priest is going to be different, and I think there's a reason why we'll get to. But notice that marriage is held up at a high, high standard for the priest. Why? Because he is serving as priest before God. He is to be above reproach. And his daughter is held to a very high standard. He has a ministry before God, and if his daughter was to turn to prostitution, she was profaning her father's ministry, bringing reproach upon him by her very actions. And under the law in Israel, she was to be burned with fire. Prostitution was a very serious crime under Mosaic law, and very, very serious for those who ministered before the Lord and for their families. We may look at that today, and I know there's some readers who will balk at that and say, but we know someone who's, perhaps they were a pastor, and their daughter was involved in a immoral lifestyle. Are you saying she should be burned? No, I'm not saying that this is civil law for us today. These were civil and ceremonial laws of the Levites. But there certainly are lessons for us to learn. That a man is to be above reproach, who is serving God, and that his family as well, in a sense, shares in his calling in how they conduct themselves. And there should be a seriousness in which we look at sin. I, I think the danger in our day and age, at least in, in the circles I find myself in, is there's a danger to be so against a legalism and a, a firmness, as is portrayed here against sin, that there's the other ditch of being far too permissive and permitting of sin, when there should be more of a balanced approach based upon the whole counsel of God. We know that sin is sin, and we know that sin is justly deserving of God's wrath and God's punishment. The punishment really described here for sin is not too stiff, not too strict, because all of our sin before a holy God deserves death. However, how quickly does it appear in the circles of our society today, sadly even within many of our churches, to take verses so clear like this that speak of the seriousness of sin and to simply dismiss them as legalism. They were not legalism. They were given by God. They were given by God for a reason, and our sin should be considered so serious. We should love the sinner, but we should hate the sin, and we should never muddle or coddle or excuse sin, which sadly in our days seems to often be done. We are to stand up for the lives of the unborn and help the mothers who have found themselves having children that perhaps they are considering aborting. Perhaps they're unmarried. Perhaps there's pressure from their family because they're unmarried. We should be loving examples of grace and truth. That's a practical application of this. But, but every single individual who has sinned in an immoral lifestyle should never receive from the church an excuse for their sin. I understand there's various reasons. Various reasons that people turn to an immoral, li immoral lifestyle. Either because of a desire for intimacy or a desire to have someone caring for them. Perhaps they've experienced very much a lack of care, perhaps even abusive environments in their home life. There are numerous stories of this. But even that in and of itself does not justify. We should be merciful. We should be gracious. But we must never, ever rationalize or excuse sin because of what someone has been through. We should always point them to the grace and mercy of Jesus, which his blood covers and atones for all sin when you turn to him. And that is what we must uphold. But it is such a delicate and hard line to walk, it appears, in our society today. Being lovingly, Confronting, tough love, biblical love, is something that appears very difficult in our day and age today. So that's an application of this part. Let's go on to verse 10. 
He who is high priest among his brethren, on whose head the anointing oil was poured, who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes. Now I want to stop right there. This is talking about the high priest. The high priest is not supposed to uncover his head. He's also not supposed to tear his clothes. What did the high priest do in the New Testament? When Jesus is brought before him, the high priest tears his clothes and rants and raves against our Lord Jesus. The high priest broke the law of God. The high priest was to be an example of, uh, of holiness and of consecration to the Lord, of wearing those garments, having that oil, yes, but he was to, to keep his head covered as a symbol that he was serving God, to wear the special garments. He also was not supposed to tear his clothes. He was not supposed to be in mourning, in other words, because he was before serving before God, serving literally before God. Um, the, the presence of God, the high priest was. And this mirrors some things we're going to see about the Lord Jesus theologically, but let's go on to verse 11. Nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or mother, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. Now, the high priest had different requirements. Notice that he is not allowed to defile himself even if his father or mother dies. He is not allowed to go and mourn for them. Wow. Why? Well, this foreshadows the ultimate perfection of Jesus. Who Jesus is perfect. Jesus would never defile himself. He never needs to be made re-ceremonially clean because Jesus is perfect. He is the standard of perfection. And Jesus ultimately would have no earthly father. He had an earthly mother. But his father was God. And he himself would go to the cross before Mary. And, and I believe that there is a foreshadowing in a sense of how the high priest was to be so set apart from the people because of his position of being the mediator between God and the people who were seeking God. Jesus is ultimately that for us, but notice all that the high priests, one man after another in their line, had to perform in order to foreshadow what Jesus would do for us. We also see in verse 13, it then addresses the high priest. The high priest had a very specific way in which he could get married. So let's look at this. This is different than the priests that we read above. Verse 13, and he shall take a wife in her virginity. A widow, or a divorced woman, or a defiled woman, or a harlot, these he shall not marry. But he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife. Nor shall he profane his posterity among his people, for I, the Lord, sanctify him. Now this is very, very interesting. The high priest, unlike the normal priest, the normal priest still was not allowed to marry a prostitute, not allowed to marry a pagan wife. That makes sense. That's the same standard for both of them. However, the, the normal priest, if you will, normal, quote-unquote, the normal priest was able to marry a widow, but not a divorced woman. However, the high priest was not allowed to marry a widow. He had to marry a woman who was a maiden, she had to have been a virgin, never married before, living a pure life. That was a requirement. Now, why is this? Why is this required for the high priest? Well, I, I believe it points to a theological truth. Because remember, all these things in Leviticus are foreshadowing. All these laws are foreshadowing what Jesus would ultimately come to do as the priest, as the final sacrifice for us. Hebrews clearly teaches that. The Bible speaks very, very clear in the, in the New Testament that Jesus is marrying the church. The church is considered the bride of Christ, and she is referred to as the pure and spotless bride that is being prepared. And when Jesus comes back, he's like the, the groom who is coming to take her to the wedding, to, to her wedding, and to have eternity in the house that he has prepared for his bride. It's a beautiful picture of, of the Lord's tender love for us. And yet notice that this is reflected even in how the high priest was only allowed to marry a virgin. He was only allowed to marry a maiden woman of his people. 
The Lord calls us as believers to live as the pure and spotless bride of Christ. It calls us in the scripture to be a people set apart for the Lord. We have been made co-heirs in the gospel alongside Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice for us. The amazing thing is we become children of God. Jesus is the Son of God. We become, spiritually speaking, the bride of Christ. It was only from his own people. Jesus has redeemed a bride, if you will, out of paganism, but he's completely purified her so that she once again has her virtue restored. We go on in this passage, verse 16. And the Lord spake, spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach a man blind or lame, who has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or a broken hand, or is a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye, or eczema, or scab, or is a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron, the priest, who has a defect, shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. Verse 22. He may eat the bread of his God, both most holy and the holy. Only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar because he has a defect lest he profane my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. And Moses told it to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel. Over and over again, we have seen this pattern that God required a perfect sacrifice. He also required, quote-unquote, a perfect man. Now, we know that the high priests and the priests lower than him were not perfect. We've seen this in numerous places throughout Leviticus, but they have to atone for themselves. They have to go through ritualistic cleansing to be ceremonially clean. The high priest himself has to offer a sacrifice for his own sin before he can take the sacrifice before God on behalf of the people. However, all this points to Jesus, who in himself was the one perfect sacrifice, the final sacrifice, and the one perfect man who could stand on our behalf as the high priest and mediator of the covenant forever. But the Israelites were to be reminded of God's demand and requirement of perfection. The only way sin could be atoned for was by blood and through perfection. And Jesus Christ is the only one that could ultimately do it. The blood of bulls and goats could never ultimately take away sin. That's why they had to offer sacrifices day after day, year after year. The book of Hebrews talks about that. And so when the descendants of Aaron and their succeeding generations would come on down the line, any man that had any type of birth defect, any type of deformity, any type of condition, he was not allowed. But notice God still graciously provided for him. I think this is such a measure of grace and such a pointing to the nature of our God in verse 22 that the man who had those deformities but was of Aaron's lineage was still allowed to eat the bread of his God. He was allowed to eat those things that were provided for him. The Levites were, did not have jobs like the other Israelites did. They didn't have all the stuff the other Israelites did. They were supported by the offerings that were made to God. Then God gave them their food, their clothing, their provision. These men, even though they had a birth defect, it was none of their own responsibility they were prohibited from serving as the high priest. They were prohibited from serving in the priesthood, but they were not prohibited from receiving God's provision. And I think that is such a point and a display of God's grace. Today, as we have looked at this passage, I hope that uh, a couple of the connections and theological connections and practical applications, I pray those have been helpful to you as we've studied this passage. Excuse me. Next time, in chapter 22, Lord willing, we're going to go on, and we're going to see both the requirements for the priests and the people in regard to the offerings. And there are some interesting things that are going to be made here and about how God provides, further talking about how God provides food for the priests, like we left off here in verse 22 of chapter 21. And then we're also going to move forward into chapter 23, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, where we're going to take some time to really go through that,
a little bit at a time, day by day, looking at the feasts of Israel. So if you've ever wondered about the Jewish feasts and the feasts of Israel, we're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about those, uh, dealing with them one at a time, and taking more time to walk through that. I pray it will be an encouragement to you, and perhaps that is an interest uh, to you or your friends. Would you invite them to join us, and, and would you reshare those as we study what God's Word has to say about those feasts? Not what some other book says about the, the feasts and perhaps their meanings, but let's see what God's Word, him, His Word says about these feasts and what they meant to Israel and uh, what they may point to for us as Christians as well, what they can remind us of as we have the full and complete revelation of God here in the Bible given to us. Let's close in prayer today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for being able to study once again in Leviticus. Father, I just continue to be encouraged and to be learning so much myself in, in studying these chapters in this book alongside, Lord, those online. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you how much it points to Jesus and how studying Leviticus afresh points to how much our Savior did. Father, how much he did for us upon that cross and how much he fulfilled that had been foreshadowed for hundreds upon hundreds of years in the Levitical system. Father, we thank you that you paid the price. We thank you that you are the perfect lamb. Father, we thank you that you love us, your bride, as the pure and spotless bride that you are coming for. Father, help us to continue to walk faithfully and humbly with you, submitting ourselves to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.